Uh, I guess, how did you start getting into tennis, really? Yeah, so of course, um, my dad, Rakesh, is a coach. um, And my brother, Amre, uh, used to play as well. He's six years older than me. Um, So dad was a coach, of course, and I used to go down to the courts with him, you know, when I was really young at the age of three or four, just to hit a ball around. But I played um, other sports such as soccer and cricket and basically any sport my parents put me into. Um, But it was just a way of me spending time with dad because, you know, he was coaching all the time till late at night every day. And I wanted to see him and wanted to go hang out with my mates. And we just decided to play tennis. And that was, you know, the way I got to spend time with dad. And I think it was also good for mom because it, you know, got her, got me out of the house and she could (laughs) do her thing. And um, yeah, so pretty much just because dad's a coach, I got into it. Awesome. And did you find like, I guess, a talent for tennis quite early on? Or was it something you kind of gradually, I guess, fell in love with and noticed you were quite good at? I mean, I guess that's a tough question because when you're young, you just play the sport because you Mm. love it and you have fun with it and you don't actually realize how good you are. You don't know what good wins are. You, a lot of, there's a lot of speculation you hear when you're young and that kind of still to today I hear, I remember conversations people had around it, but I guess when I was about 12 or 13, I was playing rip, uh, rip soccer. So for my province and, the coaches, you know, selected me to then play for Federation Cup, which is central. So it was like Taranaki, Palmerston, North Wellington, Wanganui. And they said, you know, you need to make a decision if you play winter um, winter sports or you're going to play tennis through the winter. Because it was also uh, a couple of weeks before I was meant to go to December showdown for under 12s in, uh, for New Zealand. So, yeah, I just made a decision to play with tennis. And that was nothing to my parents, but more because when I scored a goal in soccer, everyone took credit for it. But when I won a tennis match, I took credit for it myself. Mm. So I just liked taking the credit myself. Pretty selfish, but mm. that's, uh, I guess, why I liked it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that's kind of what I was going to ask next as well, because you mentioned at the start, you had lots of other sports you were interested in and also your family wanted you to play. Was there like a conscious decision of when you needed to maybe focus just on the tennis and not the other sports? And as you said, did you think that you were maybe more suited towards the individual rather than the team sports. Yeah, I, f- I found my dad, uh, he was very careful and not, uh, my dad and mom were very careful in not putting me into an individual sport very early because they wanted me to develop people skills and they weren't a fan of homeschooling and that type of stuff. So they wanted me to interact with kids my age. Um, so I think, yeah, I played pretty much every sport until I was, you know, I played until I was 13, but then I also carried on playing other sports until I was 16, 17. And um, now, you know, I can't really play any other sports because when you're full-time and you've got to look after your body, um, I mean, I try to play golf as much as I can. I love golf. Um, yeah, I think it was, uh, my parents didn't really push me into it, but I just enjoyed tennis. And I think it's important though for young kids to, to play team sports to develop team skills because tennis could be an individual sport but you've also got you know team events within tennis you got um, doubles and it might be an individual sport on the court but you have a team around you who look after you and you've got to be able to interact really well with them and operate as a team so yeah you're one person playing on the court but it does take a village um, to develop a champion I think so I think I'm pretty lucky my parents um, put me into every sport and you know, sent me through school until I basically stopped school when I was 17, 18 and did, or 16 and did um, some homeschool because I was traveling so much for juniors. Um, but yeah, until then, I was just pretty much a normal kid. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I guess was that kind of the age of 15, 16 when you and your parents decided kind of to go all in and maybe see professional tennis as a, you know, an avenue for you or was there like a turning point where you kind of decided or not really? I mean, I know for a fact my parents uh, and my brother and my sister knew the big picture, but as a 16 year old, I got to just, when they said to me, you can travel the world and see new cities and not go to school. I was like, Oh, this is awesome. Like, you know, why would you not do that? Yeah. Um, but then I look at the big picture. Um, I have no regrets on what my parents, you know, I'm so grateful for what they did for me. And um yeah, I'm still learning a lot and I'm still making mistakes. Um, 
But I think the important thing is just not to make those mistakes twice. Yeah, that's awesome. And I guess, as we said before, you seem like you're quite, you know, self-motivated. Uh, like, obviously, your parents were a big support and they kind of let you and gave you the tools to, you know, express yourself on court. Um, did you always kind of have that self-drive to go to your trainings, to go to your tournaments um, and whatever it was? Or was it something that your parents were like, okay, Ajit, you need to be playing this tournament because X, Y, Z? Yeah, I, I think, uh, well, there's two parts. It started when I was young and I never used to, my dad used to, you know, take me for private lessons at six in the morning. And I used to be like, why? Like no one else is doing this because I felt like, you know, no one else was doing it. It wasn't normal. But then as I was growing up, I used to think like, if no one else is doing it, you're special. And I used to think that you need to do something different to be better than everyone else. And um, yeah, I just found that I've always been motivated. I haven't understood the concept of doing something and not doing it to your full potential or, you know, giving your full effort. I don't understand that. So, you know, like in the mornings when I was 16, 17, I remember the New Zealand coaches told me I was unfit and I wasn't strong enough. So for six, seven months, I just got up every morning and went for a five, six K run every morning. I mean, it doesn't take much to lace up a pair of running shoes and just start running some hills. Um, and I've got the, my parents are the type of parents that whatever, because, you know, uh, so my mom's a doctor and dad was a tennis coach. He was also an accountant and um, whatever they have put me and my brother and sister into, we've had to do it uh, at the full of like best of our ability. So I just haven't really lived life any other way, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, that's awesome. And as well, as you said, you can take those lessons into, you know, anything you do, any sort of yeah. work or um, any other sport. Um, yeah, and I, I guess as well, I mean, kind of going more to the training stuff. So you mentioned you had to do the morning trainings. And I know, like with boxers, when they're kind of going up for a fight, they always say, I know my opponent's not working as hard as me. And that's kind of their way of yeah. thinking we're going to win. So I guess similar to you, did that extra training and the morning trainings, did that give you lots of confidence that you could compete at a higher level than maybe some of the other competitors? I think it does because I think you're only as confident as how hard you train. And I learned that over time that if you put in all the work, um, for example, today, my body's really sore. I'm on, I'm on holiday this week, but I'm in the gym twice a day, every day. And mm -hmm. today I was really sore, but I've still come to do like a stretching session and a recovery session um, just because you got to do something. You can't just not do anything because someone else is doing something. Yeah. And I feel that if you back yourself and you're confident in what you've done in your preparation, then come match day, that's the fun part because you've done everything you can. Mm -hmm. But if you haven't done everything you can and you haven't put in the work and you're you know, you're meant to train, you know, X, Y, Z this many hours and you haven't, then come match day, you're going to doubt yourself because deep down, you know, you haven't put in the work. So, yeah, yeah I just think that's what it comes down to is your uh, self-commitment and self-drive and you can have the most amazing facilities, the best coaches in the world, but it has to come down to you and how much you want it. Yeah, and I really like that. It's kind of like that quote saying like, you know, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. Um, yeah exactly I definitely agree like the yeah. more you train better prepared you are then yeah the the matches are kind of well you've done all the work and now it's just kind of having fun and and getting the result you want um, yeah and I guess kind of similar to that is there anything in particular that, that's kind of kept your love for tennis like is it the winning do you love like the training and how like you as a person feel better and stronger every day is it is it just hitting a ball I <sighs> It's real interesting because I feel like the last year, a lot of these, you have honest conversations with yourself and people might think that, I don't know if they think this, but seeing me play in New Zealand, that it's all good and it's, you know, I've got a wonderful, you know, I'm doing really well and I'm winning in New Zealand, but reality is that's not the world. New Zealand's not where it's at, you know, like it's cool being number one in New Zealand or you know, playing Davis Cup for your country, but you want to be playing Grand Slams. You want to be world number one in the world. And I feel that I've had a lot of adversity I've had to come through in the last couple of years and a lot of tough times where it's been, do you hang up the rackets? Do you play? And I just feel you grow as a person with that. And 
playing a sport like this, you really got to apply yourself and it's a risk. You know, you're committing yourself to, to something that uh, you might not come out with anything. And I think that's um, really building me as a person. And I think that's what I enjoy the most about is I'm growing as a person with the sport. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that I guess fits perfectly into what I kind of want to talk about next was those tough moments. So as you said, the adversity, I mean, we don't have to go into, you know, what that is, but yeah, that yeah. stuff and the failures and the losses that obviously makes you a better, a better player in the end. Um, so as a junior, was there anything maybe in particular, like I know you said with, um, with your, with the New Zealand, you know, coaches saying you're not fit and then you went for a run for six months. So I guess that's kind of something similar. Was there any other losses or bad moments that you've kind of mm, had and there, were actually, able to overcome? There actually was. There was a couple. So there was one, um, it was actually in Christchurch. I could just never win there. I just, every <laughs> time I went to Christchurch, I just, I love Christchurch as a place. Like my auntie lives there in Rolleston and I used to love yep. staying there. And um, until sets in the city this year, I just couldn't win there. But um, I, I really just had like bad memories in Christchurch to be honest like I love the place but yeah. I remember I made uh the semi-final and um one of my best mates actually Finn Reynolds uh we grew up in juniors together we were one and two and we played through juniors together he's an unbelievable player uh, amazing person great family and I was 16 at the time me and him were, were the same age and I was always ranked one and I'd never lost never lost to Finn and I remember I was playing him in the semi-final. So the draw came out and because something had happened, I think uh, he had been injured or something and he came back and he was seated uh, three. There was someone else, maybe right. Maxon was seated two. International and I ranking, played him maybe. in the semis. Yeah, maybe it was international ranking. I, I remember I played him in the semis and I lost that match and I just like, that hit me. I, I never really taken losses too hard. I just been like, ah, okay, all good. You know, you lose some club matches to the kid and you go home and, get a pie on the way home and you're fine. But, you know, like that loss really hit me hard because it was when I was taking tennis really seriously. And that kind of changed my approach on how I, I saw things. And then the other one would have been as I was playing, I was, maybe it was a year later or two years later, I might've been maybe 17. I was, I was young. I was young for a junior. Maybe, no, when I played Finn, it was the 14th Nationals. And then when I played, I was 16 playing in the junior ITX. And I just won... Wellington ITF dropping like six games throughout the whole tournament. Like I was winning every match, love and love to the semis. And then it was like a three and three. And I won doubles there too. And then won doubles in Christchurch. And then the singles final came and I just had a meltdown. I had a like, pretty sure the referees have never seen worse behavior than that. Like it was an absolute <laughs> meltdown. And I, those two matches have stuck with me because they're matches that I think I just shouldn't lose but also that I let myself down really, really badly. And in New Zealand, um, it's, I find it, found, found it quite difficult to play in New Zealand because there's a lot more pressure on me, you know? There was, mm. um, because in, internationally, I was never number one, but in New Zealand, I was. So there was a lot more pressure. And yeah, I just, <laughs> I just found those losses very difficult. And I just found it very difficult playing in Christchurch after that. But I did win my first ITF title uh doubles when i was 15 in christchurch so there is some good memories like one or two good memories but yeah <laughs> um yeah that's cool i mean is there anything you can do to sort of fix that like i know um remember coco goff's dad was kind of talking to coco during a match because she was kind of losing yeah. the plot and even though she was up five two and the dad was kind of saying just visualize yourself at your home tennis court like don't worry about the crowd and yeah like is there anything you can do with that because i think if you're I mean that's what I do because yeah when this is really weird but when you're in a match I visualize uh, this is going to sound extremely weird but this is just what I do <laughs> no, no, <it's> I, <laughs> I, I, I visualize say if I'm playing in Christchurch I visualize that there's houses and stuff outside people have normal lives out here the pressure you're feeling here as soon as you walk out those gates it's just normal life it's the world you know like not yeah. it doesn't actually look that bad on court like people are walking walking near the gas station outside Christchurch tennis club outside Wilding Park and their lives are carrying on as soon as this match is done it's carrying on so it takes all the pressure off you when you think about that that it's actually not it's not a big deal and yeah. I used to think when I was young that everyone was watching me you know everyone might have a glance every now and then and say oh great shot or oh, bad shot but 
no one's actually critiquing you as much as you think. And I feel a lot of kids think their eyes are always on them. But yeah. when I watch a match, like I couldn't tell you one junior result I remember from like bad, bad losses to good wins. You know, I, I just, no one pays attention as much as you think. So I think if you just get out of your own head and try to visualize it from the outside in, then yeah. you give yourself the best chance. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely true. I mean, as well, like when I'm coaching a lot of the younger kids and they have a bad loss, I'm, I'm always like, there's another tournament in two weeks and this result is yeah. literally relevant. Like everyone's forgotten that. Um, yeah. Especially if you have a good tournament next, then it's, again, it's, you're only as good as your last win or, you know. Um, it's, yeah, that's awesome. I mean, is there stuff like that you're kind of doing now on the professional circuit you could still do, like visualisation or? Yeah, I just tried to... Um... I mean, I'm just trying to have fun. You just got to have fun. You can't, you can't put that much pressure on yourself that, you know, like at the end of the day, like I, when I was 18, I played my first pro tournaments and I went to Uganda, which of course, third world country. Um, and being there, it just put things to reality that it's, it's pretty good in New Zealand. You know, we're young. We get a, all the younger kids coming up, they get to play tennis every day. Their, their parents are going to take them home, feed them. Like, um, it's it's good you just got to enjoy it just enjoy what yeah. you're doing otherwise otherwise the truth is just don't do it don't do anything you don't enjoy because uh you know then getting up i i love getting up for morning trainings now i love getting on the practice court and people ask me that question all the time do you still love tennis and it's like if i didn't love it i wouldn't do it so no, no yeah that, that's actually really similar i, I read a or listened to a podcast um with Joanna yeah. Conta, and she was she yeah. was saying like real similar things. And she was just outside the top hundred, playing all these yeah. challenges all around the world. And she was kind of thinking, why am I not better? Why am I not at the slams? And then once she did all this visualization and realized how grateful she was to even be playing in like a twenty five k, in you know Chicago, she actually started realizing, wow, this is awesome. I'm doing what I love. And then her results basically the next six months was when she had that really good run and got into like the top 50 and that was all because yeah, she started realizing exactly. how much she enjoys it so yeah I mean the professional circuit's you know really difficult and when there's all those losses and, and tough moments uh, if you're not left with anything kind of at the end um, then yeah what's the point point? Um, and yeah. kind of going on to that obviously with the professional circuit you've got all these draws every week going on and like juniors there's no consolation so if you lose you know that's kind of it um how yeah. do you keep how do you keep that motivation because obviously there can only be one winner um how do you keep the motivation to train and obviously it's you know enjoying it but is there anything else you kind of enjoy about the the professional circuit traveling I, I just think uh you just got to have many goals you get to achieve something new every week you get to achieve a mental barrier you have you get to, to pick off some good guys um, you might have some horrendous losses, but you learn from those. And every week there's a new opportunity and it sounds really cheesy, but that's honestly what it is. And, you know, like I know a lot of the boys on tour and they're, they're my mates and uh, not on the court, but off the court, because on the court you want to yeah. beat them. But yeah. off the court, they're your mates. And uh, I, I enjoy that. I love that. So I'm enjoying a lot what I'm doing at the moment and being able to play and, I wouldn't change it. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested because I think a lot of people actually may not have that mindset as much as someone at your age. So I'm thinking, did you do you think you kind of learned that from your early childhood? Because you kind of said at the start you weren't really interested in you know where you are, where you were, and your talent. You're kind of just enjoying playing. So do you think that kind of early yeah. childhood would have kind of related to you now? Hundred percent. I think that I've always been. Like I had an older brother, which helps because I always wanted to beat him and anything. It could be who would eat food the fastest at dinner. It would be a race down, you know, down the road. My dad would make us run home a lot from, we live 5k away from the courts. He would drive the car slowly and uh, he would make us run home and we'd see who would win. And, you know, it's just having fun with it though. It's not competing and, you know, being like malicious about it, about the, <laughs> being competitive, you know, and, and not you know not being nice but it's about just enjoying what you're doing having healthy competition around you you know challenging yourself and 
I just always enjoyed sports. And that's what I love about sports is competing. I love there being one winner and one loser and the thoughts that go through your mind when you lose or win. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I guess as well. I mean, I was kind of want to talk about strengths and weaknesses. So this one's obviously a little more related to tennis. Um, if after, a, after a tough loss, is there, is there something yeah. you do like on the training court where you have a weakness and then you're like, right, the next two hours, I'm going to fix that weakness? Or is it like my serving forehand's really good? I'm going to focus on that. Because obviously there's two different angles, I guess you could take. Yeah. Um, firstly, if I have a terrible loss, I go for like a 10K run. I don't talk to anyone. I just go run. I just go punish myself. Yeah. Um, and that's just how I've been because I hate losing more than anything. But, you know, you've got to be a grateful loser and all that. Congratulate yeah. the other guy. But I just, yeah, I go punish myself some, some way. You know, I might even be just in the room and just do uh, physical, something physical, you know. Um, but, yeah, when I get on the court, you, I definitely, me personally, break down the match of things that didn't work. I might be zero for 10 and break points and lost 6-4, 6-4. The guy had two break points and converted. Yeah. So I'm going to talk to my dad, talk to my coaches and say, look, on break points, I'm panicking. I don't know what to do. And we talk about, okay, hit big targets down the middle and then, you know, back yourself on whatever play you want to use. So I definitely, you, I work on my strengths, but I, I normally work on that when I'm confident. And then when I'm not confident, I, I bring my bring my weaknesses or whatever my weaknesses were that day up because then the gap is here and here it's not the strength climbing but of course you're always working on your strength but I'm the type of guy that works a lot on you know parts of my game that I want to work on my second serve you know I work on my second serve a lot more than my first serve um and just those type of things yeah 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 awesome and definitely a bit of both I mean and as well relating it to your play style I guess now um do you, is it something you can kind of stay confident in with your own ability of I want to play aggressive tennis or is it something that you sometimes have some self-doubts like I know for me as a junior I was quite an aggressive player and then I kind of was making too many errors so then I reverted to try and be a bit more of a grind and then that didn't really work yeah. either because I was just grinding with these guys that I should have been attacking so I kind of reverted back so is that something you struggle with or are you kind of like fully confident in your I think I used to, I mean, growing up, if anyone's watching, I used to hit like a drop shot every second ball. I used to just drop shot every single time. It was like, it was borderline really bad. But um, then growing up, uh, my game style, I try to be aggressive, you know, hit my serve hard, use my forehand, get to the net as much as possible. And I think I'm getting better and better at committing to one game style because otherwise you're just too confused. I think mm -hmm. the earlier you can assess what type of game style you want to play, the better. And I think that's really important. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, I was got to say as well, I mean, it's, it can be some, sometimes tough if you had a few maybe bad losses and, um, you know, poor results to kind of stick, stick to that confidence. So is there anything still at your age, like I'm sure there is, but uh, that you can do differently or new things you're working on? So as you said, second serve, you know, like different little things that you can add to your, toolbox yeah all the time i mean i just look at it. a fitter can have a coach then anyone in the world can have a coach you know like you can always learn stuff so i'm just trying to learn you know backhand volley needs to get stronger um i need to be tidier you know around the nest and when you're aggressive be more controlled with aggression be better with defense be, everything can improve i can i can improve on everything in my game um yeah, if, if you can't improve, if, if you settle and you can't improve with something, then I think that's an issue. I think you always got to be willing to improve something. You can be happy with where you are and be like, yeah, I'm going in the right direction, but just keep moving, keep keep improving. Yeah, do you, do you think everyone has that though? Like that self-drive to keep like pushing themselves or do you think some people do? I mean, it depends what they want to, I mean, because of course everyone in New Zealand has different goals and not everyone will want to do what I'm trying to do. And, you know, I want to be number one in the world and that's where I'm, my goal is, you know, so that's, but guys might want to go to college, for example. And I think whichever coach you're working with, you just got to sit down and both have the same goals. And then I think that's a clear, there's a clear path. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I mean, how many how many people do you have kind of in your team helping you towards that goal? So I have the dad, of course. Um, and then I've been working a lot lately with an ex player called Richard Krajic. He um, won he won Wimbledon. Um, and then Christian Grove, who is in San Diego. He was my main coach for a long time, but because of COVID, I just haven't been able to go over there. Um, so yeah, pretty much just those three guys. Then I work with a guy called Neil White, who is my um, full-time trainer back in New Plymouth. And I've worked with him for the last two years. And I have a full-time physio called uh, Justin Lopes, who works out of Auckland because I train a lot of the time out of the Levy Academy um, with Sebastian Levy in Auckland. Yeah, awesome. I and mean, how, how important is it to have that teamwork kind of around you? And how much physical and mental stuff do you think you're doing, if you could put a, a time on it, I guess? I think I'm doing more physically and mentally than I am on my tennis right now. Yeah. Um, I feel that I'm the kind of player that I could take a month off, but if I'm mentally fresh and physically in great shape, then I'm going to be fine after a few hours of hitting. Um, I don't feel I need to hit too many, too many tennis balls before tournaments, but in training, I want to hit thousands. It's a bit weird. So, um, you know, but I feel like more or less, if I'm mentally fresh and physically fresh, I can pick up the racket and be okay. Like after a long period of time, but I'm working a lot on mentally and um, uh, physically at the moment. Yeah. Is there anything kids can do? Obviously, it's going to be to a lesser scale, but is there anything yeah. kids, juniors can do, you know, at home, like small things to work on that with mental and physical? Or I think they honestly, my thing for younger kids is just to enjoy it and just, just enjoy it and be if you can start being grateful at a younger age, I think that you're going to be better off. And I struggled yeah. with that. Honestly, I was a devil. I was a devil child. I was, I was, you know, I struggled with that big time. Um, you know, after bad sessions or what I was, my behavior at times was really bad. Yeah. And, um, but I think now if I could talk to myself, if I, when I was, you know, from eight years old through to 11 years old, I would just say, relax just relax and enjoy it. Just listen to your coaches, play lots of tennis and just have fun because the more you're having fun, the more you're listening and the more you're willing to learn. But if you're angry and negative all the time, you're not going to learn. You're, you're just not going to want to listen. So I think right. it's all mindset is like, if you're a positive mindset, then you're like a sponge. But if you're a negative mindset, then you're like a piece of concrete. So <laughs> um that's just how I feel about it, honestly. Like, you know, when I go see the, my little cousin plays um, in Buckland's, Buckland's Beach in Auckland, just plays the, the little stuff with the little nets, the hot shots. Yeah. And when I go see him play, you know, at first I want to tell, like, what are you doing? You can't, you're hitting the forehand wrong. Like, he's air swinging everything. <laughs> and, like, I was like, what's going on? But yeah. he's actually just seeing, just seeing him smile and having fun. It's, yeah. uh, you know... That's what tennis is about, I feel, growing up. is just about having fun and putting a smile on the face. Yeah, it's having that intrinsic um, motivation. Like, as you said at the start, when you were doing all these, you know, 5K runs and stuff in the morning, um, you actually kind of enjoyed, enjoyed it. It doesn't feel like a chore. Mm. Like, if you're, if you're playing tennis and thinking, oh, I need to go for a run to get fitter, it's not sustainable. Whether if you're just like, oh, I really want to go for a run because I want to, you know, better my tennis and I'm loving, loving training, then it's going to be more long term um, and sustainable for you to keep it up. So what's your yeah. kind of training schedule at the moment? Obviously, this week you've got a bit more of a holiday, but maybe for like a tournament what, or, or a training, a training block, I guess. What's your kind of, I guess, an average day yeah. in the life? So when I was, I can tell you about kind of my day when I was before I left and I was on tour. So I was training with Seb in the Levy Academy in Auckland. Um, and they're very structured there. They're a very structured program, which I really liked. And uh, basically I was doing uh, two hours in the morning and then I would do uh, two hours of tennis in the morning, sorry. And then I'd do an hour of fitness, two more hours of tennis, and then an hour of recovery or even another session of fitness. Um, and by the end of it, I was 
exhausted, but it's just about building that, um, you know, that capacity to do long hours on the court. Um, and then right now, like this week, I'm not playing any tennis and um, I'm doing a big fitness session. Like the session, it wasn't actually that nice to wake up to, but this morning I woke <laughs> up, checked my phone, my trainer sent me a message and it was a 1.6K run, 20 press-ups, 30 sit-ups, 40 squats, five sets of that without stopping. So re repetitive five sets yeah. and then another 1.6K run to stop and it's an hour workout. Yeah. So... Okay. Hence why today is my rest of the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, you need one. Oh, oh yeah. So, um, yeah, he, his sessions are brutal, but I just think, yeah, it's, I love it. I love it. Yeah. Gets me better, gets me stronger, and gives me more of a chance to win. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you said, obviously, at the Lovey Tennis Academy, you've got a lot of structure there, and over lockdown, a lot, a lot of things are uncertain. So do you think, like, yeah. routine, like routine of schedule is really important? to keep oh, kind of, huge i mean yeah i was i did the first lockdown um i mean i look back at it now and i should have just done nothing i, I regret it like i just needed a rest but i'm a very routine person so i was yeah. you know i actually wrote a schedule um just on a piece of paper and you would roughly stick to it so it was like morning wake up at this time this time uh you know one of my goals was i wanted to try read four books through lots so of book a week through lockdown so I got through one book. <laughs> but, um, yeah, fair and, zero. Um, yeah I, and it was like a Michael Jordan book as well. So, but, um, you know, read for a little bit and then uh, do some stuff around the house. My parents um, do a workout, uh, do yoga, then sit up a little court outside, got my brother out there and was like hitting and then go for a walk and just having structured the day's, get chewed up a lot faster as well. I figured mm. if, you, if you don't know what you're doing, then it's kind of like you're waking up in the morning with no purpose and you don't want to be like that. Yeah. So yeah, purpose is key. Yeah, that was, that was going to be my next question. I mean, how important do you think purpose and passion is and how do maybe kids find it? Is it doing lots of sports and trying lots of things? What do you, what do you think? Yeah, it's a tough one. It's a tough yeah. one because I'm still trying to figure out a lot of my purposes in life um, at the same time. So, um, yeah, I just think, again, it goes back to what's your purpose when you, when you wake up, you know, as, even as a kid, is just to enjoy yourself. I think that's a huge one is with how things are right now with COVID and, and stuff and you know, kids are at home and they wish they're at school with their mates is just to enjoy yourself and yeah. maybe just take up a couple new hobbies or go kick a ball outside or, you know, even yeah, just, just have fun. I think that's the biggest one is just have fun because as long as you're having fun, like you'll just keep, keep ticking along. Yeah. Cool. And, and just lastly, before we go into our, you know, rapid fire, five questions at the yeah. end, what are your short and long-term goals? If you have, kind of one for each or so my short-term goals of course I want to be winning futures again um won one a couple of years ago um of course I had some injuries and COVID happened um but of course to be winning uh, futures again and just stay injury free um yeah. and then long-term goal I mean I want to be playing grand slams I want to be world number one what every tennis player's goals are I think <laughs> if you don't have that goal then you shouldn't be playing but like yeah. at this level that is not like you know what i mean like yeah yeah if uh when you're when you're traveling and it's an expensive sport you you want to be aiming to do the best and that's to be world number one um so yeah i'm just those are my goals at the moment awesome cool yeah it's I mean it's very really important to have goals because if there's no kind of vision and you know thing to strive yeah. for then sometimes it can become a bit uncertain what, what you're doing it for um yeah okay cool so the rapid fire questions just to finish off so first one we kind of answered already but what advice would you give to an aspiring junior athlete wanting to go professional or just like maybe us scholarship or i just think just keep um back to vision having a vision of where you want to go and what you want to do and um figuring out what you know with your coaches what needs to be done and then addressing that as you're by yourself you know like you 
you've got to run your own career, you, whatever you want to do. Um, you can't wait for a coach to push you. You can't wait for a coach to be like, let's train at six in the morning. You know, I was always like, let's train at six, let's train at five, let's train at seven, you know? So I think as a kid, if you can push yourself and then that pushes the coach to want to push you and it's got to work together as a team. Um, so that's what I would give to younger kids is really apply yourself, have fun and push your coaches to push you. Awesome. Yeah, I love that. Um, what is your favorite fitness exercise or like your go-to one? Running. I love long distance running. Um, I hate weights. When my trainer, I mean, I'm so skinny and small, but um, when my trainer makes me do weights, I, I'll love running. Tell me to run 20Ks, put headphones on, I'll love it. World's fastest Indian. <laughs> cool. Um, what is something people don't know about you, whether in tennis or just in general? It's weird. People, of course, I don't stop talking. I think I'm an extrovert. I'm always talking to people. But I could sit in my room for three days on my phone just watching Netflix. Um, I'd rather do that than go hang out with mates. I'm actually quite introverted. Um, and I, yeah, I'm pretty used to see everything else other than tennis. So, <laughs> yeah, there's not much to know. There's not much to know. <laughs> uh, good. Uh, what are you most grateful for? Uh, my parents. Um Definitely, definitely my parents um, for what they've done for me uh, and the sacrifices they've made for me and my brother and my sister. Um, I'm very lucky for my family and friends. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I really like what you said at, you know, earlier in the podcast about how important it is to be grateful. Um, it's something I've only just yeah. started doing kind of like six months ago and it's crazy how much more like creative and just like happy I've been. And then I don't do it for a day. Yeah, big which time. It doesn't seem like a big deal, but then you don't do it. And yeah. then... The next day I'm almost like, oh, like I can't be bothered. It's really weird. It's because it's because imagine, you know, say if I haven't done it for 20 years and then you don't do it for a day, habits have set over those 20 years. Mm. And then you don't do it for a day and you're trying to change habits. It's like trying to, you know, concrete setting, then you put some water in it, it's gonna take longer again for it to set. So you've got to stay on that to break your habit. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Um and Finally, last, last one to finish off. Um, what does success mean for you? Happiness. Um, I think nice. if I can get to a point where I am extremely happy with the person I am, then that defines my success. Because, you know, I was, I learned that when I was about 16. I, I went and played a tournament in Australia and they put me up at like, the Sheraton or something in a penthouse and at the time I had a fight with my mum and dad and when I fight with my mum and dad also my brother and sister won't talk to me it comes like a joint package in our family there's a lot of yeah. there's a lot of like four v1s and tough stuff going on so yeah. um I had no one to call no one to call and share how awesome this hotel room was with and it's just a little thing but that made me realize that what's the point doing something if you can't share it with the people you love. Mm. So that's why, yeah, me being happy and just enjoying and sharing my career with my family and friends that define success to me. Awesome. Love that. Yeah. I think the big thing, I mean, yeah, for you is just enjoying the process, you know, being grateful and then how, how those like adversity, you know, moments and, and losses and stuff through your juniors has just like defined kind of who you are now, both as a player. And it and hasn't, it hasn't person. um like this isn't the stuff I'm saying, I'm even like, whoa, like that actually sounds quite maturity. And you know, <laughs> I still struggle with these things big time. And I'm lucky I've got some really good mentors around me that help me out and um keep me honest with myself. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, always improving and always, always learning. Um, yeah, thank you so much for for chatting with me, and um, really nice. wish you the best for all your endeavours in on the European circuit at the moment, and hopefully uh, some good results. Having to keep keep an eye out for those. Appreciate it, thanks, mate. And no, just uh, thanks for having me, and uh, yeah, I hope all goes well at home, and hopefully we have some uh, New Zealand champions uh, on the rise.